God's grace, his mercy, his peace are yours through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we look to the gospel lesson, that first miracle in Cana, I read a lot of different takes on the importance of this, this miracle. It's interesting, since this is the first miracle that Jesus in his public ministry that began at his baptism, does this miracle at this place, and, and some say it starts out, it says the third day, and oh, you know what it is? The third day means Jesus does this miracle because he's pointing to another third day, a third day when he rises from the dead in the empty tomb. That's the significance, it's the day. Or maybe it's because it's, it's at a wedding and, and what Jesus here is doing is saying that he sanctifies marriage and says it's a good thing. That's the importance that, that Jesus is there in, in a wedding saying man and woman together that he sanctions family and this is a good plan of God. Some say that he turns water into wine because he's sanctioning drinking wine. He wouldn't turn it into wine if wine was a bad thing so teetotaling isn't necessarily the most important thing. Or turning something into wine, water into wine, this is pointing ahead to that important meal that takes place in the upper room where, where he serves wine and says, this is my blood given and shed for you. That's, that's why he does this. They look a lot at this miracle and they try to plug it into to Jesus' ministry. And I, I think we need to just take a step back and say, why did Jesus do this miracle in Cana? And, and to look maybe at the meaning or the heart behind this miracle, because if we read too quickly and try and jump ahead in Jesus' life, life we might miss it. So maybe I'll just ask you a question. If, if you were the Savior, you were God in the flesh, just baptized, it was revealed in the Jordan River that you were the Son of God as the Father's voice and the Spirit came down and there you are revealed, and now you're to do your first miracle to show your power that you are God, what would it be? What would you do? How would you do it? I don't know. Maybe he could fast forward a little bit to feeding the 5,000. That seemed to be a pretty big deal because then you would count the women and children. That's a lot of people fed like this, right, with leftovers. Why, why did he drive out the storm right away or, or go and just say, I have now healed everyone that has leprosy? Or, or maybe say, come on over and go to, a, go to a cemetery and then just say, rise and out of the graves come all these people. The significance that would have, the impact, people just, uh, it would spread, right? Why didn't he hover over Jerusalem and just take out Herod and all the rulers of the Roman army? And that would have an impact if you want to get the Jews' attention. What did Jesus do? Well, after he had a busy time, he went to the Jordan River, and we don't really learn a lot about Jesus' life. We're jumping ahead about 27, 28, 29 years. Here a little bit, we go from manger to wise men to uh, Jesus growing in wisdom and stature. We hear him going to the temple, performing all the things that the Jew needs to do, living under God's law, and then boom, we get here. And we're on the heels, too, of Jesus calling a few disciples, going out in the wilderness, and they're being confronted by Satan and, and never giving in to those temptations. And now we're here. It seems his mom must have got invited to a wedding in Cana. And Cana isn't much of a town. I've been there. It's tiny. It's just this little burg that's behind a kind of on a, off on a hill. And, and I think even today, Cana, what, what is their commerce there? People like to have weddings at Cana, so that's a business. And, and they also have where you can go and do wine tasting and buy wine from Cana. But Cana, of all the places... Why there? And then Jesus does this miracle. And, and let's just take a few moments to see the meaning behind the miracle and break this down a little bit into sections. And, and the first part, it just starts out, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I guess when I look at these words, the, the thing that comes out to me in the heart of the Savior is he cares. It's a pretty insignificant problem if you think about it. Someone had underplanned for the wedding ceremony. 
and they ran out of wine. Either people drank too much or they just didn't plan enough, invited too many people. And it was a big deal in those days because the wedding wasn't like today where you invite people at 2 o'clock, you have a half an hour service, take some pictures, go to the reception, do a couple dances, then go back home. This was a long celebration over days, even a week. And there was a lot of different things and steps along the way. And then the final procession, it was leading the bride finally to the home. And all this thing took place. The whole town and relatives celebrated. And this was going to be a big deal because now they ran out of a chief thing. It was wine. But if you think of all that Jesus came to do and all the problems in the world, this was a pretty insignificant thing. And yet, Jesus' mother Mary saw that there was a problem and she had been waiting for 30 years, pondering these things in her heart, wondering when the Savior would act. And I don't know if she was there at the Jordan, it doesn't seem so, but she knows that this is the Son of God in the flesh. She knows that Jesus is the one, if anybody, that could do something in this small town because there was nowhere to get wine that was needed. And so she simply presents to him the issue and says, Jesus, can you do something about this? Jesus is no longer under the jurisdiction of mom. Now he has changed his role. Now he is under the jurisdiction of his father, living under his will and his command to serve in our place. And it's interesting how Jesus has this dialogue saying, what is this that we have between us, woman? Not mother, but woman. And yet Mary persists and just says, do whatever he says. We can learn something from Mary here, too. She appeals to Jesus' care, and, and Jesus did care, and she presents to him, here is an issue, Lord. Do with it as, as you will. Do whatever he says, she said to the servants. Can we approach Jesus in the same way? Isn't that really what our prayer life is like? We have one who has the power to do all things. He is God, and he has a heart for us, every single issue he has said take all your cares and worries and anxieties and give them to me i want to make your burden light there is no problem too small no issue insignificant that jesus doesn't want to know about but he'll do it in his time in his way using his power always appropriately but jesus cares i think sometimes we think god is too busy or we just think that we don't want to bother him and we don't tell him enough. We don't present every worry and care and concern to him. We don't think that he has bigger things to do, but we think that he has bigger things to do and this isn't important, but everything is important to Jesus. But we also have to follow Mary's lead and say, Lord, may your will be done. And evidently, this must have, been in line, must have been in line with God's, the Father's will for him that this would be his first miracle because we see what he does. So I look at this and say the meaning so far is that Jesus cares and then Jesus acts. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. Jesus answered in a very significant way. And as I look at these words, I, I just see Jesus being generous. Think about how much wine was provided for this gathering. Uh, even on a conservative note, if you take a modern-day bottle of wine, 750 milliliters, uh, that's about 600 bottles of wine on the conservative end, if those were only 20-gallon jugs. 600 bottles. Jesus didn't say, well, tell you what, I'll give a few bottles of wine so that the head table can make a few toasts, but I'm not going to supply for everybody. Jesus just simply said, go do this, and presented for this couple an amazing and generous gift. On today's standard, let's say if it's a bottle of wine that is only $10, just the standard bottle of wine, that's about a $6,000 gift on the conservative end. If this is high-end wine, it may be $100 a bottle, you're talking about a $60,000 gift just given to the couple as his first miracle. Doesn't this just represent the heart of our Savior who is so generous? And we can 
pour this into our lives too, can't we? To see how generous Jesus is for us. He gives and he gives and he gives. So generous in what we have. Just even think about this morning logistically. You get up in your controlled environment home, not experiencing the weather that's outside, and though it's cold for a moment, eventually your car that starts heats up and brings you in a heated vehicle to here, and then you have jackets on, you run into a heated environment so that you can worship the Lord. He's generous in just these simple ways that we take for granted. I'm sure many of you had something to eat today. There'll be free coffee that you can have right after the service. And these are just little things throughout the day. Think of how generous God has been to you, even over the Christmas season. Kids, I know that a lot of times on your gifts it says grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, or Santa, or the elves, or whatever it is that's on the label. But these are all gifts to you from a generous God. And, and in our American way, I know it's through hard work and labor that, that these things come to us. We do the work, we get the check, we make the purchase, and it becomes ours. But God gives us the ability to work. God gives us the ability to think. God puts breath in our lungs and brain waves in our brain. Jesus is generous. But even more generous than the stuff that we have and the things that we enjoy in abundance. He is generous in the most important way. He is generous in his grace. Again and again we come to him wounded and hurt or just full of sin. And so generously he comes to us with his grace and his forgiveness. He says, put it all on me. And God sees this transaction again and again and says, not guilty to you. So generous is God in so many ways. He was generous at your baptism when he called you into his family. He, he made you his brother, Jesus says. You're my brother, my sister. And God the Father says, my dear child. He writes you into his family. He says that now your eternity is secure. Not this world, not sickness, not even death can take you from me. So generous is our Savior. And I like to just take this image a little further too. Since it is a wedding, I'd like to take this picture to what Jesus is doing now because we have already seen and we're following the cycle again of what our Savior did. He, he came for a single purpose, right? He came to be the sacrifice that God would accept for the sins of the world. We see that work accomplished. We know the tomb is empty. We know the Lord ascends. And Jesus, in so many ways in Scripture, points to a wedding that he is planning. And he wants to be generous. In fact, he's going to be generous. If he's generous here, how much more generous is he going to be in the wedding he's planning? But he's not a steward. He's not the one that is under plan for how much wine would be needed. And it's not going to be in Cana. It's, it's going to be in heaven. But in this wedding, the one who now has all power and authority and dominion is planning a wedding that will go on forever. But he's the groom. And he invites the bride. And if you've been a groom, you understand when a bride captures your heart that <laughs> there is no thing that is insignificant that isn't worth troubling yourself over. There is no sacrifice that is too much to give. When a bride has your heart, you can't help but sacrifice and give. You are his bride. There is no issue or problem that is too small for him to deal with. There is no sacrifice he would not give. And he uses his power and his authority to be generous to you because there is a wedding that is coming that he is planning. And it's going to be good. It's going to be perfect. And it's going to be forever. So we learn that our Savior cares. Our Savior is generous. And we learn one more thing here as we continue. He did not realize where it came from, the, 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 the groom, the steward, though the, stu the servants who drew the water, knew, or drew it, had known it. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This the first of his miraculous signs, 
Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Notice how he gave his gift of wine. He asked for no praise. He did not say, uh, it's time that you toast the real savior of this wedding, right? He went in silence away after this and really drew no attention to himself. And if there's one thing we learn here about our Savior, even though this was the time to display, display his glory, to show he's God, he does it humbly. That maybe should strike us too. Imagine if you had done this. Wouldn't you want to at least let the groom know, I'm the one that saved the wedding? Wouldn't you want to let the steward know that you underplanned and so I'm the one that came to the rescue? Wouldn't Mary want to say, hey, ah, now after all those years you're saying, you know, you're talking a lot about your son. Yeah, he's a nice guy. He seems to be perfect, but he's no savior. Mary doesn't seem to say a thing here either. He does it in absolute humility because the point was not that he would get credit for this. The point was not that, hey, this could be a money-making venture. Imagine selling wine. He could fund a lot of ministry through this. It wasn't so that he could for a moment give some people some happiness as they had plenty to drink. It wasn't these things, these worldly goals. It wasn't to make something of himself for himself. He announces his glory in a very humble way because the goal of a miracle was to impact hearts. Isn't that how God works with us today? He comes and hides himself in such humble things. A, a splash of water? Really? Really? That's how God comes to us. We don't have to do anything. We simply receive from him Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That changes everything for us. He doesn't say anything about himself here and say, hey, look what I did. Instead, instead he says, look who you are. He hides himself in, in wine and wheat and some comes and says, taste and eat. This is the goodness of God, sins forgiven. A life restored, an eternity guaranteed. He, he hides himself in words and a page that come and impact hearts. He does it so humbly and so generously because he wants this result. And, and really, if you look at all the things that happened, the good tasting wine, the celebration that was saved, the generosity of the miracle, finally we see at the end what his goal was and his disciples put their faith in him. Jesus revealed that he was a worthy savior in which, in, into which the people, his disciples, could trust. Just a few. Did the bride and groom ever find out about this one who saved the wedding? I don't know, it doesn't say. Did the steward know who he should give credit to? It, it doesn't say. But what we do see is that his disciples put their faith in him. And that's what Jesus wants to accomplish with you and me today too. That's why he records this miracle. So that we can see in such a simple and humble way that he cares, that he's generous, that he's humble, and that he's God. He's your Savior in whom you trust. But I think this miracle can have one more meaning and one more impact because we who are of faith, who believe in this Savior and know who he is, and know that he resides and dwells in our hearts, may these characteristics, these meanings of the miracle reside in you too. That Jesus looks and says, you who believe in me, you care. You who believe in me and whom I reside, you are generous. You who believe in, in whom I reside, you, you are humble. Who would have thought that a little water into wine in Canaan would have such meaning. But would you expect, expect any less from our Savior, who is God? Amen.